Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for joining us for our Good Friday service. Uh, today we're just going to uh, we're going to read from the Gospel of Matthew to read some of the events of uh, the last moments that Jesus had on the cross of Calvary. And then we're going to partake in communion together. And so if you have uh, some bread, some juice, and they're on the house, uh, we're going to ask you to uh, get those ready and we're going to partake together. So as we, we begin... Let's uh, just bow our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for what you did for us in the cross of Calvary. And in these moments, Lord God, I, help, I hope you uh, just bring to, into our heart uh, what you did for us in the cross of Calvary. How you lavished your love upon us and the sacrifice that you gave to us so that we may know peace, love, forgiveness of sins, and the hope that we have in Christ. We give you the thanks. In your name we pray. Amen. So let's begin in, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 27, starting in verse 11. And let's look at that together. It says, While Jesus, meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. And when he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, Don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? Because Jesus made no reply, not even a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. Now it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Jesus Barabbas. So the crowd gathered, had gathered, and Pilate asked him, them, Which one do you want me to release to you, Jesus or Jesus? Jesus Barabbas, or Jesus, who was called Messiah. For he knew it was out of self-interest that they had handed Jesus over to him. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas, and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you? Asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I then with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? Pilate asked, and they all answered, Crucify him. Why, what crime has he committed? Asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, Crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but instead had uproar, an uproar was starting. He took water, washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. All the people answered, his blood is on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus to the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And then they twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand. Then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the, st the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe, put on his own clothes on him, and they led him away to crucify him. Verse 32. When they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry his cross, the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes and cast lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed a written charge against him that said, This Jesus, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, Who are you going to destroy the temple? 
and build it in three days. Save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he says, I am the son of God. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. Verse 45. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, He's calling out for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with white with wine vinegar and put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest says, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. When Jesus had cried out in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those who were with him, who were guarding Jesus, saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely this was the Son of God. Many women there, watching from a distance, they had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. As evening approached, there was, came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite of the tomb. You may think, why did all these events happen and take place? Uh, many that were looking forward to the Messiah did not see that the Messiah would have to suffer, that he would have to die on the cross. And so that's why they misunderstood what was taking place that day, and so they hurled insults at Jesus. They mocked and scoffed him, and they were part of his shame and disgrace, the very people that Jesus was going to the cross to save. We get a little more understanding from Isaiah chapter 52, verse 13, and then it goes into chapter 53, but it's a prophetic a uh, passage written by Isaiah, written several hundred years before Jesus would even be born and die on the cross. And this is what Isaiah says, See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured and beyond that of any human recognition or likeness, so he will sprinkle many nations, and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see. And what they have not heard, they will understand. Who has believed our message? Verse 1 of chapter 53. And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. See how prophetic Isaiah is? Verse 4. This is why he did it. Surely he took up 
our pain, and he bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God or stricken by him, afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions, and he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, or some translations say stripes, we are healed. We all were like sheep that have gone astray. Each has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was like a lamb that was led to the slaughter, as sheep before its shears are silent. And so he did not open his mouth. We see that, how he, he f- refused to defend himself before Pilate. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, yet of his gen- generation protested. For he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of my people he was punished. Not for his own, but for their transgression and our transgressions. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. There is a prophetic about Joseph of Arimathea who provided a place for his death. Though he had done no violence nor any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. And after he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied, referring to the resurrection. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. So he's going to provide salvation and forgiveness of sins for us. Therefore, I'll give him a portion among the great. He will divide the spoils among the strong, because he poured out his life unto death, and was numbered with the transgressors. He bore the sin of many, and made intercession for them. Isn't that a powerful passage that just just gives us insight as to why the events on Good Friday took place, why Jesus had to suffer? You know, and as we partake of the Lord's Supper, or we often call it communion, uh, Jesus would observe this the first time on Thursday night. Um, It would be yesterday evening. He would observe uh, the Lord's Supper with his disciples. Uh, He'd have some bread. They'd have some grape juice. He'd tear the bread. Uh, He would break it, give it to each of them, and likewise they would each have some of the grape juice. And it was to symbolize what he would do on the cross of Calvary for them. But they were gathered there that night to celebrate the first night of Passover. Uh, Passover was started back in Egypt. The first time was when that tenth plague came across the land of Egypt. It was the death angel. The firstborn of every household was taken that night, except for those of the Jewish faith that had taken a lamb, a perfect lamb, and had, had, had killed that lamb and had, had cooked it, and they ate it that night in haste with bitter herbs and spices. And that night, if they took the blood of the lamb and applied it to the doorposts of the house, the death angel passed over and did not harm anyone in that household. Passover would continue to be celebrated year after year to remember what God had taken them through in their deliverance out of Egypt. But when we see Jesus die on the cross, we see that he was our Passover lamb, as Isaiah mentions. He was the lamb that would be offered for us. He would be the lamb of God that would die on the cross for our sins so that death could pass over us and that we could know eternal life and the forgiveness of sins. It's powerful. It is truly powerful what Jesus did for us on the cross of Calvary. You know, we're all going to die, aren't we? That's the fact. But if the blood of Christ has been applied to our life, if we have accepted what Jesus did for us, on the cross and asked him to be our Lord and our Savior. He has promised to forgive us of our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and to be our Lord and our Savior, to give us the promise of heaven and eternal life with him. 
And that's my prayer for each one. And, and maybe you haven't prayed that prayer. Maybe you haven't made that decision today. I know many of you have, but maybe some of you haven't. I'm going to lead us in prayer before we partake of communion. Um, and so if you have not prayed that prayer, if you have not invited Christ into your life, I'm going to encourage you to do that now before we partake together. So would you bow your head and let us pray together. Father, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for Good Friday, and we thank you for the work of Jesus on the cross. And so right now, Lord God, we, um, we ask you to forgive us of our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, if we haven't invited you into our life, you said you, you stand at the door and knock. If anyone opens the door, you will come in and have fellowship with them. And Lord God, if, if that speaks to anyone out there today, Lord, um, you honor that prayer if we make that our own. And Lord, you promise to come in and be present with us. Forgive us of our sins. And as we make you the Lord of life, you'll guide us down the pathway of life and ultimately into the gates of heaven. And Lord, as we partake of the bread and the grape juice, Lord God, it symbolizes your body that was broken for us and your life that was poured out. Lord, we God, we do this in reverence and we do this with gratitude for what you did for us in the cross of Calvary. And we ask it in the precious and the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. So at home, if you would uh, take the bread and the grape juice. And it says that Jesus took the bread and he broke it. It symbolizes his body that would be broken, that would be torn, that would be crushed, that would be pierced. That would receive the crown of thorns and the, the lashes upon his back. So that by his punishment, he took our punishment upon himself, our sin. And the punishment for it, he took it upon himself, upon his body, so that we could be healed. So take a piece of bread, if you would, and let's partake together. This represents Christ's body that was broken and crushed for us. In the same way, they took the cup, and this represents Christ's body and his life, his blood that was poured out for us so that we could know eternal life. So let's partake together. Amen. Praise God. Lord, we just thank you today. We thank you that we could gather uh, wherever this is reaching today, that we could gather in our homes uh, to remember what you did for us on the cross of Calvary. You call us to do this on a regular basis, to remember and to keep before us that we were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ and to live our life in a way that honors you. This is our act of worship, you said in Romans, that as we give our lives to you, as a spiritual act of worship, it honors, it glorifies you. And Lord, we give you the thanks this day, and we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining us for our Good Friday online service today. And I, I hope that God spoke to your heart and to your life and, and that you're excited about Easter. We got some exciting things happening. We're going to have a sunrise service at 645, so pray for some decent weather. You can find us on Facebook Live for that. I'm not planning on putting on that on YouTube. It'll just be on Facebook Live. And then at 10 a.m. on Facebook Live and YouTube will be our Easter service. And so we're excited about that. And we're looking forward to that. Um, and then after that, hopefully it's nice enough. Many of you received gift baskets if you had young children of uh, some Easter eggs and some other th surprises there. And so we encourage you to uh, take a picture there's some selfie signs that are in those bags that have Radiant Springs Church on there. Hold up that selfie sign. Take a picture of you and your family uh, enjoying Easter, maybe doing the Easter egg hunt or gathered around the table. And then post it to Facebook. Maybe tag, we'd like it if you tag the church there, uh, Radiant Springs Church. And so that way we can uh, share in the moments together since we are not able to worship together at this point. It's one way that we can kind of share in some moments and uh, see... Uh, see what's happening in each other's homes. So God bless you today, 
And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you bright and early Sunday morning. God bless.